So we've talked about this numerical flux for a while now. Um, we saw that for the, uh, the linear advection equation, we had this upwind flux and we, we discussed what we would expect from our flux in more, generally, uh, uh, more general cases. Uh, an example being an Euler equation, which is an example of a hyperbolic uh, conservation law. Uh, we might have a compressible Navier-Stokes equation, a Burgers equation. So what kind of actual flux expressions do we get for those equations? Right? We talked about the consistency and the conser uh, conservativity of these fluxes, uh, but we didn't get uh, any more specific than that. And so in the next couple of videos, I'll fill in this table uh, that you're seeing right here uh, for four of the most common uh, flux formulations that you'll see in, in discontinuous Gulurk in um, literature or, or methods. And on the left, I'll, I'll fill in the, ex the general expression for these fluxes. It's often a little difficult to get general expressions for these fluxes because uh, they often focus on a one-dimensional case. Um, they really are based on like a finite difference or a finite volume kind of perspective. And we're kind of adopting these to a discontinuous Gulurkin method, which is a, a finite element method. But I, I hope that I've uh, written them in such a way that they're relatively general uh, and we can use them for, for discontinuous Gulurkin methods as well. Uh, and after we, uh, I fill in the, the left column here, I'll also work out the expression for the particular example of precisely that linear uh, advection uh, example where our flux was equal to uh, the advective vector times phi. Uh, recall that and we're working with a PDE where we're saying that the time derivative of phi uh, plus the divergence of the flux function which should be a, a vector valued function, right? And that's the case because we have this advective vector A here, and then that's going to be equal to zero, or potentially some right hand side. Um, and that would be the divergence of A phi in this case. And if uh, A is then divergence free, then the chain rule actually says uh, that this is going to be the same thing as, as A uh, dotted with the gradient of phi, right? So then we have this equation. Yeah, so again, uh, for the, the advective equation that we've seen a couple of times now, and we also talked about the advection diffusion equation, but this will be the advective limit. Uh, we're dealing with a flux function as the one on the top here. Okay, so let's start with uh, the first flux, and this is uh, the most basic one, really. This is going to be the lax friedrichs flux. And I'll first write it down and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it. So we have this hat indicating this is the uh, numerical one. Then we have LF to indicate lux Felix. And it depends on the solution on both sides of the interface. And I'll already dot it with the normal on the plus side. So this is going to be defined as what well, the average of the flux the true flux, or not the numerical flux, but the true flux, dotted with the normal, plus c over 2 times the jump of phi, also dotted with the normal, where c is going to be defined as the maximum of the absolute value of the derivative of the flux, let me actually write this out. Excuse me. Dotted with that normal, and then the maximum of. Um, let me change this phi here, we'll change this into an, an S, and I'll say the maximum of S, where S is between the maximum of phi plus and phi minus and the minimum of phi plus and phi minus. Okay, so what do we have here? We have a numerical flux, um, which is again a function of uh, the values on both sides of the interface, uh, defined as well the average of the true flux. Um, yeah, okay. 
um, plus half of the jump of the field multiplied by a coefficient or a constant, well, I wouldn't call this a constant, but a uh, coefficient c, uh, that is also has a definition uh, as sort of a maximum uh, derivative here. So I think this is relatively difficult to understand, and that's why I would like to focus on, on the example here on the right. Um, and then we'll also see how we're going to deal with the average of, uh, of, a, of a function f here um, as only a function of phi. So let's think, uh, before we do that though, let's think about the two concepts that we talked about last time, uh, consistency and conservativity. Consistency meant that if we have the true solution phi, uh, then the lux friedrichs flux becomes the normal flux. Well, what does that mean? That means that if we ha substitute in both slots of lux friedrichs here, simply the function phi, which is going to be uh, a continuous function, so it doesn't have a difference between phi plus and phi minus, right? It's a constant, uh, continuous field, there's no jump. Um, then we should just receive as an output f of phi. Is that the case? Um, well, the only thing that's going to stop that from happening was this jump right here, the jump of phi. Uh, and if phi plus and phi minus are equal, then that is equal to zero. And then we simply get the average of the, the flux on both sides. Well, again, because there's no difference between the values of phi on both sides, that's also going to be the same value. So indeed, we find that the lux Friedrichs a numerical flux becomes the true flux. Okay, good. So we have a consistent uh, numerical flux. How about the conservative uh, property? That meant that we have uh, only a single value for this flux. If we evaluate the expression on either side, we should get the same, exp the same, the same, um, the same, the same value for um, f dotted with a normal, uh, except for a minus sign. So let me also kind of already emphasized that here. So I'm going to focus on uh, the, the n plus side, and I'll get back to that as well in a second. Um, but that's just for convenience sake. Of course, we want to be able to evaluate this on both sides of an interface. Uh, and we're already baking into our definition that that's going to be single valued, meaning that f hat lux Friedrichs evaluated on the other side, but still with phi plus and phi minus, dotted with n minus, that we're going to define that to be equal and opposite to the one if we dot it with an, an n plus. Nah, I don't want to have my minus here, sorry. I'm going to have my minus here. Yeah, so uh, if the normal switches direction, so n plus becomes minus or is equal to n uh, minus n minus, uh, then well we get, we get the same expression here for uh, for f hat. Mm -hmm. So that means that this is a, a conservative flux. The value is going to be the same on either side. Um, we have a jump of zero, and that produces this uh, interesting conservation property. Okay, now. Then let's take a look at this example of, uh, of the linear advection. And what I'll do is um, I'll draw a particular combination of two elements and then we'll focus on a certain face. So we have an element here and an element here. And suppose that my advective vector A, suppose that it runs like this. So that's going to be A. And our whole objective, oh, I see, you can almost not see that. Our whole objective with these definite, or the way that we're writing these discontinuous good-looking methods is that we kind of want things to be independent of what we define to be the plus side or the minus side of an interface. Um, so I'll actually show that we're going to get the same expression independent of whether we call this plus and this minus or the other way around. But I'll stick with this one first. And then we get a, uh, 
according to this definition, our normal is going to be outward facing. So this is going to be equal to, or this, this vector is going to be n plus. And well, this vector would be n minus. So that's going to be the, the opposite direction. So what do we get for this numerical flux if we have um, a setup like this? So we have f hat lux Felix phi plus phi minus dot n plus. So I'm going to evaluate or I'm going to consider the numerical flux on this edge. So we get the average of f on either side. So if I write that out, that is simply equal, that's defined to be equal to half of f on the one side plus f on the other side. Or, and depending on how you want to write this, it would be, um, uh, I guess you could write it like this, to make, just to make this a little bit clear. It would be f on the one side and f on the other side. Well, f on the one side is going to be defined as f phi plus, and f on the other side is going to be defined as f uh, phi minus. Plus c over 2 times the jump of phi dotted with our normal. And the way that we defined our jump, I'll already just substitute that in here is uh, phi plus, so let me lose our jump si uh, si uh, symbol, phi plus n plus, plus phi minus n minus. And lastly, for c, we're going to need the derivative of f. I'm already write that down at the, on, the, on the top here. So what do we get? Um, how can I do this best? So we get d d phi of f phi. Well, that's of course simply going to be equal to that vector vector. So what is c going to be? Well, it's going to be the maximum of uh, of of over over different values of phi of this derivative. Well, we see that this derivative is actually not dependent on phi anymore. So we simply get um, the absolute value, right, of the derivative. Well, that's simply a uh, dotted with n plus. And since this is an absolute value, I'd already like you to, to appreciate or understand here that this is going to be independent of uh, which normal vector I take, right? Um, a dot n is simply going to be some value. Uh, if I change n just the direction uh, the direction of it, well, it's going to change the sign. Uh, but since we're taking the absolute value, that's not going to uh, lead any difference, lead to any difference. Okay, so then let's write this out again. We have half phi at, uh, or f at phi plus is going to be a, and sorry, this should still be a dot n plus u. And here as well. a phi plus plus a phi minus and I'll pull in this uh, normal vector and we get a dot n plus phi plus plus a dot n plus phi minus well I actually don't really like the way that that looks we have an n plus and a phi minus so I'm just going to flip the normal sign I'm going to say this is going to be equal to minus a dot n minus. Plus half of a dot n times phi plus n dot n is going to be 1 plus phi minus n minus dot n plus is going to be minus 1. So we actually get a minus sign here. And there we have it. Now we can simply, uh, we can still simplify this a little bit. 
Um, and we'll do that by, cons by, by looking at different cases for our definitions of n plus or of our definition of the plus element and then uh, the minus element. So for the case that we're, we're, we drew right at the top here, uh, we have n plus a is larger than zero, right? We have that the vectors are, are pointing in the same direction, so we get a, a dot uh, a product between them that is, is larger than zero. So for this case, We have that a, da, a dot n plus is positive. So I can write this as half of, well, this is going to be the same thing as simply uh, a dot n plus. That's well, the absolute value of positive thing is the same, or the, uh, since the positive thing is the same thing as its own, um, its own uh, absolute value. Again, since that is independent of the normal vector, that's uh, going to be the same thing as a dot n. Yeah, so that's, that's equal to this guy times phi plus minus, I probably should already move this down, uh, minus a dot n minus. Well, we know that that's going to be a negative value here. Or multiplying that by a negative value, so that's also going to be a positive value. So actually, I'm going to get a plus here, the absolute value of a dot n times phi minus. And then we still have the, the other guy over here. So that's going to be plus half of a dot n phi plus minus a dot n phi minus and then we see that two of these cancel so this is going to be equal to half of a dot n times phi plus good and again i can actually rewrite this now as a half of a phi plus dot n plus right because we knew that a dot n is in this case uh, going to be equal to a dot n plus, yeah, because that was the positive sign. So that is going to be equal, let me reiterate this, this is going to be equal to the Lux Friedrichs flux dotted with n plus. So what is, what is it going to be, what's the Lux Friedrichs going to be if I dot it by n minus? Well, that's going to be the negative of this. Yeah, so uh, the following from this, we have that uh, LF of phi plus comma phi minus dot N minus. Well, that's the other side, really. It's going to be the negative of this. Well, that's going to be, of course, the same thing. I can simply, okay, let me write this out. Minus A phi plus dot N plus. Well, naturally, I can simply uh, pull that negative sign into the, into the normal. And so we get here. The negative sign, yeah. So, in a more general sense, I can actually write it like this for the uh, linear advection case. Dotted by n plus or minus as half of a phi plus. That's important. Uh, but this negative sign is going to change as well, right? And if we write a plus minus like this, now what I mean is that if we choose we can either choose all the top ones or all the bottom ones, right? So we can either choose plus and plus, or we can choose minus and minus. Okay, so this worked out quite nicely for this particular choice where I'm, I'm picking n plus to be the vector on the, the upwind element. So what happens though if I, I had chosen actually a different uh, definition? So let's work that out as well. So let's try draw the same two elements but now let's call the the downwind one uh, the plus one and the the upwind one the negative one and we're still going to deal uh, with an advective vector that points in the same direction 
What will we get then? Let me see if I can just show this quickly or else I'll write it out again. I think it's worth the practice just to write it out. Uh, one of the assignments you'll have to do this um, these write-outs as well uh, for the Burgers equation. So that's going to be slightly more uh, complex potentially uh, because that's a nonlinear equation. Um, but I, I wanted you to see as well how this works uh, for just a, a relatively simple example. Okay, so I'll just write it out again. Um, so we have again the lux Felix flux, uh, phi plus, phi minus, dotted by n plus, is defined as half of while well, the the flux evaluated on either side. Uh, so that was equal to um, a phi plus plus a phi minus. And that was dotted with n plus. Let me already execute that. We get dot n plus plus a phi minus dot n plus. And then we say, well, we don't like the way that that looks. I'm going to flip the sign here. Minus, minus. But now we have actually that, that this guy is positive, right? A dot n minus is going to be positive. And A dot n plus is going to be negative. Okay, well, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Let's first uh, work out the second term. Uh, so C is well, still going to be the same thing. That's going to be A dot n. But now we actually have that this is going to be equal to A dot n minus. Okay, and then we have uh, phi plus n plus uh, plus phi minus n minus dotted by n plus. Well, okay, that still works out to be the same thing. And we get phi plus minus phi minus. Okay, so let's make use of these two, these three things that I've underlined here. And let's say, well, this is going to be equal to a half of, well, this is, this is going to be negative. So I can actually say this is going to be minus the absolute value of a dot n, phi plus. And well, this guy was positive. So I actually have now minus also a dot n, phi minus. And I have uh, also half of a dot n phi plus minus a dot n phi minus in the second term. Oh, I can already see which one cancels. And this is going to be equal to a dot n phi minus. And now we can see that this is going to be equal to a dot n minus phi minus. Sorry, I'm, <laughs> that, that was a mistake. Uh, we have here is equal to minus this, right? right? Two minus signs here. So that's going to be equal to minus a dot n minus or equal to uh, a dot n plus phi minus. Again, that's going to be equal to the Lux Felix if I uh, evaluate it on the, the plus side and do, dot it with a, a normal vector on the plus side. So what happens for the Lux Felix flux if I evaluate it on the, the, the minus side? Well, that was equal to minus this guy or a dot n minus phi minus. Is this the same thing as what we had over here? As what we had over here. Well, here we have a um, half. I don't think the half should be here. Excuse me. Right, we're adding together two halves, so it's going to be whole. Okay, um, so here we have a phi plus dotted with whatever normal we're using, and here we have 
a phi minus dotted with whatever normal we're using. Well, that's going to be the same thing because we, we changed the order of the elements, right? And what we actually see is that it's always going to be the upwind element. Yeah, so what we're seeing here is that irrespective of how we choose our elements, uh, the Lux, Friedrichs, Flux, this is going to be the conclusion of phi plus and phi minus for the linear advection, advective case, dotted with the normal from either side, plus or minus, is going to be equal to A dot, well, whatever that normal was, times phi upwind. And that's, that's going to be uh, independent of how I'm ordering my elements, which one is going to be plus, which one is going to be minus. Uh, and this is precisely our upwind flux. This is precisely the flux that I'm asking you to implement in your homework assignment. Yeah, so we're seeing that the, the lux Felix flux actually for the linear invection uh, case becomes our, our standard upwind flux. Um, and again, irrespective of how we order our elements. Now, you might be thinking, why am I dotting this with this normal all the time, right? Because uh, clearly this seems to be saying that simply the Lux Friedrichs is going to be equal to A, uh, or A times U phi upwind. We have to be a little bit careful there, because uh, uh, if something is, is true, dotted with the normal doesn't mean that the whole vector is going to be the same thing, right? That's why I'm being a bit tedious here. Now, only its, it's normal component is going to be equal. I suppose that... Um, we might even yeah we might be able to say that uh, for for these cases indeed the lux Friedrich flux is going to be a equal to a dot phi upwind, uh, but uh, for more complex cases we really have to be very careful in, in handling the normal vector in the right way. Okay, so this is the first example of a numerical flux. This is a pretty straightforward example. This is the most basic example. Uh, we often say that this is a very diffusive flux, though, um, so it's going to introduce a lot of numerical diffusion and well. We've seen so far that that's precisely what makes a method stable, uh, but we also saw that that can tend to make a method uh, converge a little suboptimally. Uh, so for finite volume methods, um, this is actually a lower order method. We we'll see that in DG things are a little bit a little bit different, as you'll also see in your homework assignment, um, because finite elements just uh, work under the hood different than finite volume uh, methods do. Uh, so it's not uh, inherently a, a first-order method in DG methods, uh, but it is a, a more diffusive flux than the other ones. Uh, so your solutions are going to tend to look a little bit more diffuse than, than what you might get for other uh, fluxes. Um, now, we saw that it's a conservative flux, a consistent flux, so those are properties that we're happy with. Uh, and again, this is now for the specific case of the linear advection diffusion that it becomes an upward flux uh, for... Other, uh, other problems, Euler, uh, incompressible Navier-Stokes, and the Burgess equation, it's not going to be quite as simple, and I'm asking you in your homework assignment to work this out for the Burgess equation. So I'm, I'm, I, help, uh, I hope that this uh, helps a little bit that I'm working this out for the simple case here. Okay, that's it for this video, and I'll uh, get started with the second flux, and probably I'll try to make those videos a little shorter, because now we've went through most of the basic ideas. Okay, see you in the next video.